the right <coughs> of the citizen to travel upon the public highways and to transport his property thereon either by a carriage or automobile is not a mere privilege which a city may prohibit or permit at will but a common right which he has under the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, where does the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness come from? That is direct out of the Declaration of Independence. That's not in the Constitution. So they're considering the Declaration of Independence, and rightfully so, as an issue of legal authority. And that case came from Thompson versus Smith. And uh, here I, we have this book that I mentioned, and I'm going to just go ahead and read a little bit off of it. Uh, Signs of the Times. Many other cases could be cited to prove the outright corruption and subversion carried out by the judges, lawyers, police, and legislators today. They all must protect the system that feeds them at the cost of defying the law and individual rights. And undermining the right to travel, anyone who has studied into the right to travel issue soon discovers the many tactics and methods used by government to con people into submitting to its control and thus waiving their rights. Here is some proof of this. The illustration on the following page is an excerpt from the book written to instruct traffic officers in the law regarding the use of roads by automobiles. The section on operator's license clearly reveals the deliberate corruption and subversion implemented to undermine the right to travel. And it's right here, uh, a traffic officer. Chapter 3, the operator's license, section 31, general considerations. Every state requires some form of operator's license to drive a motor vehicle. Now that language is very clear, folks. I don't know how it is that uh, they, the only way I can figure how it is that they're misinterpreting it is that uh, they're not educated. Well, anyway. for, first of all, they don't understand the definition of motor vehicle. See, if I have a right to drive my car, but I don't have a right to drive my motor vehicle. In fact, I don't have a right to drive my car. I have a right to travel, travel in, my car, in my car, but I don't have a right to drive my motor vehicle. Uh, okay, so every state requires some of the operator's license some form of operator's license to drive a motor vehicle and prescribe in some detail the method of procuring such a license. If you will think about it for a moment, you will see that the system of operating, uh, sorry, operator license is one of the basic elements in the entire motor vehicle control system. It enables, and there you go, control system. It enables the state to set standards on qualifications for prospective drivers to check holders of licenses as to their present qualifications and by revoking the license to eliminate undesirable drivers. It also serves as a basic identification document for traffic purposes and all in all is probably one of the most valuable pieces of paper that the average American possesses. At least he acts that way. <laughs> this, is some, this is very corrupt language. I hope you folks out there are getting this. In order to allow the state the broad powers of control, over motor vehicles that it must have to keep the roads at all safe, the courts had to do something juggling with our traditional ideas as to our rights and privileges as citizens. After all, doesn't every taxpayer help pay for the roads? And therefore, shouldn't everyone have an absolute right to use the roads as he sees fit? Well, if this were the case, then we could forget all about any effective traffic control because such rights could only be controlled by very elaborate and complicated court procedures. To get around this, the courts set up the theory that the right to drive is a privilege and not a constitutional right. Private privileges are subject to state control with a minimum of formalities, whereas rights are surrounded with constitutional protection and can be moved only by a legal bulldozer. Man, and this, this, is the, this is from the manual for the traffic officer. You know, this is what they're teaching them. I mean, they're basically teaching them uh, without, without them having an education as to what rights are and what travel is and what driving means and what motor vehicle means. They're just throwing this language out, telling them that, uh, you know, like, like the language, how the courts got around this, you know, uh, and how the courts set up the theory. I mean, that means it's not law. The, those who do not consent to be governed cannot be governed, you know?
I think that most police officers out there are doing an honorable job of doing the best they can <coughs> to um, yeah. help society. <coughs> it's a dangerous position and they go out every day not knowing whether they're going to be attacked or not. Yeah. So, you know, I want to give my respect for those that serve. I would hope that they would listen to um, some differing viewpoints and, st and start researching the authority that they are operating under and whether they are actually harming the public through the actions that they do. I mean, we all love seeing the police officer show up when there's been an accident and protect us from being hit by some car who's driving by, you know, waving them around or calling for ambulance and all that. And I'm sure that the police officers do not enjoy handing out tickets or do not enjoy <coughs> domestic violence, you know, confrontations and whatnot like that. So I just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. You know, that's a misconception that a lot of people get when we start um, discussing this material. A lot of people start to, you know, think that we're, we're, you know. Against the police. Exactly, you know. And I think that that defense mechanism, uh, I think it could be more properly called an offense mechanism because um, it's, it's a shortcut to uh, destroying the argument completely, you know, because, I mean, uh, a man like me, when someone comes to me like that, I mean, that, that's going to make me stop and go, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, no, 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 you know, that's really going to interrupt the thinking process and the communication process that we're going by. Um, to try and get our, our, our point across. And our point is not in terms of an opinion. We're not trying to say, hey, this is my opinion. We're trying to say, hey, take a look. We've got truth here. There's truth, there's lies. There's reality, there's non-reality. You know, there's maxim and non-maxim. And uh, there's tradition and non-tradition, you know. And uh, uh, so, you know, we're trying to get people to look at truth. And they get confused thinking it's opinion. And they also get confused that we're saying that, uh, you know, the police are bad or something, which we're not saying at all and don't feel at all. You know, and that's why I'm wearing this shirt today. You see, folks, the Oath Keepers, go to OathKeepers.org. It's an organization full of active duty and uh, retired military and police. Who are taking the oath to support our constitutional rights. That's right. They are, they are reaffirming their oath to the Constitution to protect the rights of Americans and of the country of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and uh, not to undertake certain things that have been put out by the Department of Homeland Security, which uh, for the folks out there who haven't read this, uh, these things, I'll, I'll, I'll be bringing these things in so we can do a program that, you know, somewhat centered around, uh, you know, how, how we're being looked at. See, we're Americans, right? We're the people on land in America. Uh, so we, we've got this uh, Department of Homeland Security that actually has documents that I will bring in and show you that uh, basically the best way I could put it is a 10-year-old boy walking down the street in his neighborhood that takes a look around and decides he feels like something in the neighborhood should be changed for all the people is basically a potential terrorist. <laughs> okay, you now know. if you think David <coughs> Eric McMahon talks fast, get a load of this guy in this video. We're going to show you a video why you should never give evidence to the police through your testimony when you're questioned. You, it can only hurt you. experience here today and I thought I would take advantage of this opportunity to do something that's been on my mind for a while to stand up and to proudly say God bless America God bless the Bill of Rights and thank God for the Fifth Amendment I'm not ashamed to say I'm proud of the Fifth Amendment and I'm not I'm proud to admit on camera and on the internet that I will never talk to any police officer under any circumstances with all due respect sir <laughs> I'm doing something really extraordinary here today something you'll almost never see another law professor do as long as you live I'm really putting myself on the spot here. At my, this was my idea. By my invitation, I have given up half of my time, approximately. I'm giving equal time and the last word to an expert who really knows something about what I'll be talking about. So I'm opening myself up to the possibility that he will contradict me. I was a criminal defense attorney when I was in private practice. So I want to make sure, in fairness to you, if I'm misleading you or giving you a slanted or one-sided presentation, you'll be able to get the last word from somebody else. I'm sure he'll have a lot to teach all of us, including myself. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution provides no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. And this unfortunate amendment